Well, there it is. It says we're live. Hello, hello. It's Tuesday, 4 o'clock Pacific, 5 o'clock uh, Mountain here in Costa Rica. We're on Mountain Time. Uh, 7 o'clock on the East Coast, midnight in Dublin, 1 a.m. in London and most of Europe, 8.30 and 9.30 a.m. in Australia, Wednesday morning. 11.30 a.m. in New Zealand, Wednesday morning, and it's Facebook Live. So hello, hello, glad to be back. Um, uh, I've been traveling last couple of weeks, and so it's, I'm glad to be back with you again. And, um, uh, I'm gonna do a shout out here. Marcy's not here right now, but I think I've got it set up. I'm to see how competent I am here to bring up uh, uh, our Facebook Live so I can say hello to people who are signing in, but. I'm not that competent yet, so it'll have to wait. So I'll say hello once I get this up and running properly. So let's talk about my guest. Um, Keith Norris is a friend of many years. He and his wife, Michelle, are the founders of Paleo FX, which is the largest movement worldwide, as far as I know it's worldwide, Keith will tell us, but um, uh, in the world of bringing accurate information about the paleo type of lifestyle, which we initially all heard about as being um, a meat diet. And but there's so much more to it than just that. And so Keith's here today to share some of that information with us. Keith, nice to see you. Dr. Tom, it's great to see you, brother. Yes. You. And yes. I will just say that you are a lot more tech savvy than I am. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I've got a great team behind me. They they always make it work, and and somehow I I if I do what they say, it always works out. So I'm I'm really grateful for that. Um, so I'm just going to scroll down here. Here's a live. It's, there we go. I've got it. Hey, I did that without Marzi. How about that? So that's great. So uh, let me see what who's here. If I can bring that part up, I think I can. Uh, Dorada, first one's Dorada from New York City. Hey, Dorada, nice to see you. Thank you. Genevieve is here from Canada. Whereabouts in Canada, Genevieve? Tina's here and says, hi, Dr. Tom and Keith. So glad to see you guys are coming in. Thank you so much. And um, so Keith, let's just get started. Um, when I think of you guys, I think of you and your wife as the pioneers in bringing this concept of the health benefits for some people with a paleo type of lifestyle. I, I see you guys as the pioneers, meaning you started coming on board and you were talking about this long before it was a fad. And uh, uh, kind of, you know, we've walked similar paths, uh, you guys and myself, uh, me with gluten. I started doing talks about gluten in uh, 1998. Um, and so before most people knew, had ever heard the word. And I know it's, it, it was like that for you guys. So I guess my first question is the difference from your early days where you felt that you really had to defend that there was some good science behind all of this, where, and today where it's more or less common knowledge, the people who are coming in at an introductory level, are they more knowledgeable now than they were back then? Yeah, I think they are a lot more knowledgeable, Tom. They, uh, they have access to more information. Um, you know, they, the information is, is out there now. Like you said, back in 98, there were very few people talking about this kind of stuff. I mean, we're talking, you know, Art Devaney, Boyd Eaton, people like that. I mean, these are the true pioneers. And I, I appreciate the comment about Michelle and I, but I wouldn't consider us pioneers so much as we were early adopters. Mm. We saw, you know, we, we, we were not the scientists, right? right? We had, we had, at that time, we had corporate gigs. Um, I was training people on the side, athletes, and I, understood the benefits of what I came to understand as the paleo diet. And much of this came through, you know, old, old school message boards with Art Devaney and Rob Wolf, right? And I just kind of jumped into the mix and, you know, I wasn't a scientist, I wasn't an academic. I, I was very steeped in athletic training and I knew 
that diet played a big part of that. And so it wasn't a big leap of faith to me to go, well, if it makes, if it can help make athletes better athletes and they're better performing athletes, if they are eating this way, it wasn't a big stretch for me to go, well, maybe the average person on the street could actually, you know, turn around their obesity, turn around heart disease, turn around diabetes, all of these things that were plaguing the nation at that time already. And those of us who were in the mix could see what was going to happen. I mean, you see the trend, it's just going to multiply over time. And, you know, it was clear to us that this was the way to go. And, you know, yeah, if we you're, had- you're, you're, you're selling yourself short a little bit. That uh, right, you guys weren't scientists in laboratories, but you are effective communicators. Right, and you and you could take what you were experiencing and what you were hearing about, and you effectively packaged it in a way that people could hear it. And right, hundreds of thousands have heard it. So, the people who are coming to you today to learn more about paleo, just that. Right. Compared to the people who you were talking about paleo with back in uh, 20 years ago, are right. people are people more educated today? Are they more receptive, or do you find that it's about the same level of? I'll put my toe in the water, but don't try to be too weird about it. Right. I so. Here's what I see. I, I see people have access to a lot more information, right? So they, they come into the game with more information. Now, do they have a deep understanding of all of that information? That's a totally different story. For instance, many people I talk to who are new to this game confuse carnivore and paleo and keto. And they get that all wound up and mixed up. And, well, let's break that. Let's break that right. down right now, because people are going to be asking. So right. you brought it up. So tell us about the three. Right. So, and the way I explain this is, paleo is a large umbrella diet, right? And the paleo diet can skew way towards the keto carnivore side, and it can skew way towards the plant based side, and it encompasses this wide spectrum so and i explained to people that my paleo diet doesn't look like Mich my wife doesn't look like michelle's paleo diet she has special dietary restrictions that i don't have and what do you I, mean? what what do you mean like no pork or no chicken or right oh well so for instance michelle long ago had her gallbladder removed Right. So she has to, uh, to supplement in, in a special kind of way, which we, we can dive into. I'm sure your listeners know about this. She has to supplement in a certain way so that she can better digest fats. Mm -hmm. Right. Ergo, she doesn't eat a high fat diet, keto, towards a high fat diet. I, I do. I have a gallbladder. I function beautifully on a more of a keto, I call it a keto flex diet, hat tip to Benazadi. I call it a keto uh, flex diet where I'm keto most of the time and then I'll have a bolus carbohydrate hit because I am still a very, very active, I like to think of myself as an athlete still, <laughs> but I am still a very, very active person and I want the ability to be able to produce power very, very quickly. So what you're saying is that a paleo diet is not a formatted, you, you got to do it this way, but even within the umbrella, it's specific to the individual. Yeah, it started off that way, Tom. You know, back in the day, paleo was very, this is the template and this is what we do and we don't eat rice and we don't eat legumes and, you know, dairy is verboten and all of this. But we've, we've learned since then. We've adopted different things. We understand that there is a difference between, you know, uh, a, a pasteurized dairy and non-pasteurized dairy. We understand there is a there is a vast difference. We understand there are some people who can handle ripe white rice beautifully. We understand that there are some people who, for whatever reason, Michelle, my wife being one of them, cannot tolerate sweet potatoes. Sweet potatoes used to be the, the, the paleo carbohydrate gold standard. Well, come to find out, if you do glucose testing, Michelle's glucose goes spiraling out of control on sweet potatoes and she's fine with white potatoes. 
So, I mean, there's all these little nuances that we start to, that we start to dive into and we start to peel apart. And so we understand that diet is very, very individualized, even though we can say general things, you know, we can generally say that sugar is no good for anybody. We can generally say that gluten is no good for anybody. You know, there's no dietary requirement for gluten or sugar, Um, you know, but beyond that, it's, it's pretty individualized and we can start off with these basic templates to kind of put people in and then you test drive it kick the tires drive it around the block and see how it, how to see how you look feel and perform hat tip to rob wolf for that for that line but it's very very true that's yeah uh, so that's a critically important concept that it's unique to the individual and there's no package for a paleo no package for a keto no package for a carnivore that's right for everyone. You I may... like to say, I like to say it's a philosophy. Uh huh. Right, like Buddhism is a philosophy, right? Try to package Buddhism into a template of, and you'll come up with you know ten thousand different ideas and never hit it. Mm-hmm. Paleo is much. This it's a philosophy. It's a dietary philosophy. And that's the way I like to present it. And what are some of the indicators by which a person can strongly suspect they might benefit from looking under this umbrella of paleo? Well, what what might some indicate? What what are the uh, lights on the dashboard in someone's body that they can? Well, you know, I've got this and this, so maybe I do good on paleo. What what do you look for? One of the biggest thing when I so. Back when I actually trained people in a, in we, I used to own gyms back in the day before the whole paleo FX thing came about. Michelle and I uh, owned gyms. Michelle ran a catering business. And so when I was actually training people and back when I, when they would come in and I would go, okay, this is, this is what we're going to do for training. I got this covered, but for, for you to be effective and for me to show you results, I am going to need you to change your diet. Are you willing to dive in with me in that? And they would say, sure, that's why I'm here. You know, it's kind of a self-selected group coming in the door. And I would lay out this template for them, just a basic, I call it, I call it meat, nuts, and leaves, and and a smattering of fruit diet. I didn't call it paleo. That's just what I called it. It just, it just said, because why? Because that's what they ate. And they would ask, you know, um, I think I threw vegetables in there somehow. I can't remember how I right now. I had a catchy phrase for it at the time. I'll have to go back and figure out what that was. But but I would get all these questions from them like, you know, should the, should the steak be cooked uh, well or medium rare? I'm like, yes, whatever, even raw, I don't care. You know, should the vegetables be cooked? Preferably, yes, or easier to digest for most people. And I, I would get all these like minutia questions and I would say, hey, just eat the diet. I don't care how you cook the steak. I don't care how you cook the vegetables. I don't care what you do with the leaves. Just do not put on salad dressing. Hit me with olive oil and some balsamic. And let's follow this for a while. Now, the first things they would notice is that inflammation in their body would drastically decrease, right? The water, I mean, it would just, if they would come in one day, you know, bloated and puffy. And two days later, they come in, you're like, whoa, that was a drastic change. You know, it's so the inflammation in their body is already starting to come down. They're so, starting so to show that's up. so that's an important point that if you're currently holding extra water, and how do you know? He said, I'm not holding extra water, I'm fine. Right. Right. <laughs> how do you know? Take your socks off. Are there sock marks? Yes. Around your legs. Um, or if you take your slacks off your underwear line, that's edema. Well, you know, I've got tight underwear. So buy larger ones and, and you'll still get the, the uh, ademinous marks, right? So that's a really good point that you just yeah. brought up is that that's a first in- indicator that if you're holding extra fluid, likely looking at modifying the way that you eat, what's on the end of your fork is going to be a benefit. That's it a good a- basic concept. Yeah. And and remember, Tom, I am, you know, when I was working with, I was working with people who expected me to know the science and they didn't want to deal with it. Right. These are, these are doctors, attorneys, they have busy gigs or entrepreneur, high, high level entrepreneurs. They don't have, 
the time or the desire to dive into the minutia. They wanted to look, feel, and perform better. And yeah. so I, everything I could to immediately get them to look, feel, and perform better, I changed the diet. It had nothing to do with the workout, by the way. Nothing. In fact, I tell people now, I could have had these people push a car in the parking lot back and forth for their initial two weeks of working out. It did not matter what I did as long as I didn't hurt them. Right. It did, seriously, it would not matter what I did. As and long they, as and I they lose hurt. a lot of water, they lose weight, their energy's up, they feel yes. better. Right. Um, uh, that, that's, that's such it. a very, so, okay. So the, the first one uh, I heard that you said was water retention. Right. What's, the, what's another um, a hot light on the dashboard that says well, you might benefit from looking at this? A, a um, you know, a side benefit to the water retention is obviously people are going to get on the scale whether you tell them to or not. Right. And I, and I would preach this to people do not get on the scale. Right. Because you're going to drop weight. Yes. And I am going to put muscle on you, which is going to make the scale go back up and you're, it's going to get into your head. You don't get on the scale. Of course, they always did, which was fine for the first couple of weeks because they're dropping water. Right. So the scale's just plummeting, 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 plummeting. Um, but that is another indication. You're, your body is getting rid of this water because it is getting healthy. Yeah. It doesn't need to retain yeah. this water anymore. And so, and so I, I think the second biggest one, Tom, is just, you mentioned this, and, and this is hard to quantify, but they felt better. Yeah. They just generally weren't plagued with like my stomach hurts, I feel bloated, I feel you know foggy headed. Um, I wake up in the morning, I feel like I haven't slept at all, although I've been in bed for eight hours, you know, I, I did, none of this adds up. They change their diet and miraculously these things start falling into place. So now you've got their attention. I've dropped all this weight, water retention. I feel better. This guy must have something going on. I mean, this blockhead must know a little bit about right. what he's doing. Right. I yeah, you know, I started, I opened my practice in 1980. Valentine's Day of 1980. And the first talks that I gave outside the office was the fallacy of the bathroom scale and just how detrimental and sabotaging it is to check your weight every day. Yeah. Much more important to check your body composition, what percentage muscle, what percentage fat. And, and we'll talk about that. But right. let's go back to, I, I, I need to say hello to a few people. Maggie's here from Cleveland. Nicole's here from Florida. Lisa's in Tennessee. Tam, uh, Tam Pham is in Anaheim. Genevieve is in Montreal. Salute. Uh, Jean says hi from the northwards of Wisconsin. Steps in Missouri. Mike's in Medicine Hat, Alberta, Canada. Well, thanks so much, Mike. Uh, that's that's out there. That's off the beaten path. I'm wondering if the Tam fam who is in Anaheim is visiting Anaheim from Austin because I have a very good friend Tam fam from Austin. Tam, if that is you who is in <laughs> Anaheim, hello. If it's not right. the same person, hello anyway. Yes. <laughs> Lucia's in Tucson. Larry's in Mexico and says, hi, I bought the book. Well, thank you, Larry. Uh, I don't know if you mean my book or... Uh, <laughs> Uh, Keith's book, but either I one. I have and read. I'm down with it. Right, right. <laughs> uh, Corazon's here from the Philippines. Hello, Corazon. Tell us, what time is it in the Philippines? It's Wednesday. I think it's is it still morning there. Send us the time. I, I've got a little thing. I, I'd like to know the time that people are watching. <laughs> Kathleen Cousins is here. Uh, Susanna says, hello, doctors from Oceanside, California. And Shanquila says, hi. And this, this is the kind of questions that Shanquila asks regularly. I know this. I, I don't know her personally, but I know this person. Uh, great, great question. She said, I've heard that citric acid is really mold. Should we steer clear if we see this on ingredients list? Huh. I don't know. That's the first I've ever heard of that. That's a really good question. And she's been doing her homework because citric acid comes from fruits. Uh, uh, that's its main source, but there is a synthetic derivative that is made from mold. Oh. So if, if uh, an ingredient lists citric acid, you need to call the company and say, what's the source of the citric acid? Is this a synthetic? Because yes, uh, it's a really good question, Shankar. Like usual, 
your questions are right on the money. You know, uh, I often say that when people tune in, you know, you can have a whole lot of information about paleo. I mean, you can be at the master's or PhD level, or you can be here today at the 101 level. And this is an introductory toe in the water. And then next time you look at, you know, you'll be 201 and then 301 and then 401 and then the master and the PhD. Well, Sean Quilla is one of those that's postdoctorate it, as a consumer. Um, she's really diving into this and she wants to make sure everything is right, which I think is great. And everyone I hope is heading in that direction in your life. You need to be more offensive than defensive, meaning asking lots of questions about what's right in my body. Right. Critically important in this time that we're in right now, more than ever. I like to say 1% better every day. If That's we can good. Keep that trajectory yeah. going, then, yeah. then you can go on forever. Smaller Chris person. Lennis is watching. Chris Lennis. Now, is this the Lennis clan from Dearborn, Michigan? Because if so, you're my cousin. And uh, Lennis is an unusual name. So Chris, you might be a cousin. Welcome, thanks for being here. Susanna has a question. If you form IgE to peanuts, does that mean you can't eat them anymore even if you fix the leaky gut? Could the IgE formed uh, and the, could the IgE formed from a leaky gut? Okay, good question. Uh, the answer is there's no evidence that a true allergy, which is an IgE reaction, that's the only one that technically is an allergy. The rest of them are sensitivities. But uh, there's no evidence that um, a dysbiotic gut, at least I've not read any evidence, that a dysbiotic gut stimulates the IgE immune reaction. Uh, as far as I know, it's always been considered more genetic and crossing a threshold with very little ability to detox, that those two together make someone more IgE sensitive. Um, I don't know of a, uh, uh, a paper on the dysbiotic gut uh, being responsible for IgE. Uh, Keith, do you have uh, any other information on that? I do not. This is so... Dr. Tom, this is where Michelle and I would defer to the experts. This is how PaleoFX started, by the way, because we weren't experts, but we happened to have a Rolodex of people that we would call when we had questions, personal questions. And when I had questions about clients and the diet, I would call these people. And after a yeah. while, it's like, I wonder if, what would happen if we brought all of these people together for a, like a mastermind or so, what would that look like? Yeah, yeah. That was how, it, it, seriously, that was how PaleoFX started. Oh, great, oh, great. Yeah. And, and the attendance before this COVID thing, the attendances were, am I right? If, uh, I'll, I'll just ask you, Right. What's, what's the ballpark? So the last show we had, we had 8,500 in attendance over the three days. And we were on track in 2020 for 10,000. We were we were looking to crack 10,000 before we had the uh, the plug pulled. So well, I can understand, and I'm sure that would have happened. And now now it's a new world. Now it's just That's new, new world. world. Yeah. To, to to complete Susanna's question, Susanna, as far as I know, once you have an IgE reaction, you produce a memory B cell, and the memory B cell, any time that you are exposed to that particular. Um, um, it's called an allergen. Your immune system thinks this is a offensive food um, that the memory B cell gets activated, as far as I know. Um, so it's permanent, meaning uh, staying away from peanuts. Now I will throw a plug in here that E3 Advanced Plus, a digestive enzyme that we talk about so much, uh, and Wheat Rescue, the uh, newer uh, one in the stable of digestive enzymes, both for gluten, they break down 99% of any inadvertent exposure to gluten that you might get, but they also break down the top eight allergens, which includes peanuts. And the key is this occurs within 60 to 90 minutes before food comes out of the stomach because the sentry standing guard are in the first part of the small intestine to say, we got a problem here, we got a problem, something came out of the stomach that wasn't killed by the acid, some kind of 
<laughs> bug or something. And then here comes the whole inflammatory cascade. So these two new nutrients break down 99% of peanuts before they get out of the stomach into the small part of the intestine. So if you have a child with a peanut sensitivity, these digestive enzymes are really good preventive to take uh, with, with every meal. Just take one, they're very safe. They're not gonna cause a dependency or anything like, they won't reduce the amount of um, food that, uh, or the amount of enzymes that your body produces. So when, when you're taking enzymes for their digestive food function, the best way that I've ever thought of is you take the enzyme in the middle of the meal. When you take it in the middle of the meal, then that glob of food in your stomach, the enzymes are digesting from the inside coming out and your enzymes will digest from the outside coming in. Much better, uh, more comprehensive. But when you're taking an enzyme to prevent an immune reaction, you take it before you start eating so that it's at the bottom and nothing gets through out of the stomach that shouldn't. Okay, so that's the difference on the enzymes. Makes sense. Uh, so Maggie asked the question, Keith, so what's the bottom line? No carbs? <laughs> so here's my answer. It could mean no carbs if you want to go full on carnivore or if you want to go, you know, uh, full on keto, it could mean no carbs. It doesn't mean no carbs for me. I'll give you an example of what I had for dinner tonight. I had steak and avocado. And what did I have for breakfast? I had bacon and a few slices of bacon. That's been my meal today. Tomorrow it's going to look different. I don't know exactly what it is, but it will look different. I will probably throw a sweet potato or two in the mix somewhere. And why is that? Because I intend to do a very, very hard bike ride later that afternoon and I want the carbohydrates. So this is how I play back and forth. Now the day after this, I'm gonna be traveling. I'm gonna be on an airplane all day. I'll probably fast. I won't eat at all until we get into Sedona and I may eat when we get into Sedona late that evening. But it, this is how my diet is. It is very flexible. For me, I value flexibility over everything. So but let me, health, let, me let me say here, um, Scott, uh, uh, you're talking PhD level of what I hope every person who's watching this has the goal to be able to do. Right. And the only way you can get to that kind of knowledge on your body is one step at a time. It, you know, you exactly. learn, learn one thing and then you learn one more thing and then you learn one more thing. Oh, that didn't work. And then so you forget that one, but you learn one more, you learn one more and over time. But I love Maggie's question because it's so typical. So what's the bottom line here? Give me the bottom line. There is no bottom line. The bottom line is what works for your body. Now there are basic principles that um, um, are consistent. And the most common principle that I think that people think about when they hear the word paleo is yes, meat, no carbs. And so that's a common yeah. 101 level of understanding. And that will probably work for most people, but right. in the long run, it doesn't, you know? And then they feel guilty because they're cheating. You know, I had a cheat day or some, some uh, coaches say, well, you can have a cheat day once a week. And right. they're trying to you know, take some pressure off for people. So what, um, what you're hearing here uh, from Keith is the PhD level, actually the postdoctoral level, because he's trained his body over the years. So Keith, if we're talking to somebody about this concept that it's not a package deal that's right for everyone, how do you counsel them on this? Yeah, and, and so this is where I come back to the template. So I, I will explain to people that, you know, it's just what we talked about before, that this is a multivariate diet. It, it depends, it's highly individualized. It, it uh, you know, depends on your own personal biochemistry, your, your, what's going on in your life, what your health is currently right now, which that, that makes a big difference. 
And then I will lay out a template, much like I did for my clients back in the day. What does that template look like? It looks like meat, vegetables, leaves, and nuts. Cook them how you want them. And so, <laughs> yeah. and, and so what happens for a while on le uh, meat, vegetables, leaves, and nuts, you feel great, you're losing, you're losing water, you know, the scale's going down, and you hit a point where you're kind of like stable. Right. But if, if you're getting into exercise, you have a really good exercise class, it may be the next day that you crash. Yep. You crash because, and you have to like fall in the mud crash enough <laughs> times to realize, as Keith has realized, you know what? I'm going to eat a sweet potato because I'm doing a bike ride later. And yeah. I, I need a little more fuel accessible. I mean, that's the kind of stuff that you learn over time. And you got to crash and fall in the mud to get there. I'm, there's no easy way around it. Now, with the help of with with the help of a good coach and guidance, you you can reduce how dirty you get in the mud, right? You don't have to fall yes, in the mud so often. Absolutely, and you're but, right. And it is it, and it is a test drive, right? I would have people on this on this template diet for a while, and then I would say, okay, I want to take the uh, I want to take the reins off a little bit. I want you to now start bringing in foods that you want and see how you feel. See how you feel. You know how you feel now. Yeah. We'll call this the gold standard. Now, this let's just start with that for a minute. When you say, see how you feel, are you talking about, well, if I eat pizza, I don't feel good afterwards. Are, are you talking about that? Or are you talking about something hours or the next day or both? So that's part of it. First of all, I, want, I had them dial into how do they feel on this diet on the yeah. template we know how we know how we feel everything's lined out we've got this inflammation thing seems to be taking control we've lost all this water weight we're feeling great now i want you to slowly introduce foods that you want nine times we live in south texas nine times out of ten that food that people would want would be tex-mex they would want to go out and have a big tex-mex meal i love tex-mex too i've just what found a way to, to what work around mean? Uh, Tex-Mex Tex -Mex is uh, a, a, a fusion. It's a regional fusion of, uh, of Mexican cuisine and in Southwest Texas cuisine. It's so you're talking about a barbecue with beans and rice? Barbecue, beans and rice, lots of cheese, tortillas, all the things. Oh, 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 right. Oh, so it's oh, all right. the things. And they would go out. Um, there, there would probably be plenty of Lone Star beer added to that, right? Because that's the national beer of Texas, along with the Tex-Mex food. And they would just feel wrecked. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm noticing that you referred to it as the national beer of Texas. It's the <laughs> state beer of Texas. But only Texans say, well, it's the national beer of Texas, right? <laughs> that was their slogan, by the way. The national oh, beer of Texas. Right? <laughs> Spoken um, like a Texan. That's great. Right. <laughs> um, but inevitably, okay, they would do that. And I knew they would do it, right? You know, it, it's like sending your kid off to college, right? I know what you're going to do the first couple of weeks when you're away. You're going to, yeah. par I mean, I know, I get it. They would go out, have their meal. Sometimes it would be pizza. Sometimes it would be, you know, whatever, ice cream, whatever their food choice was. And you know what would happen. They would feel wrecked. They would feel horrible. And then it's like, okay, now we, now we know the difference between feeling good on a diet and how these foods can affect your feeling. Now we're going to have this interplay between us to figure out where do you want to be on that spectrum? How often, how often do you want to feel bad like that? Is it worth it to you to feel bad like that? That's a really good kind of mitigate the damage somewhere in between. Can right. you have a bite or two of it and then go back, you know, and, and so you start teaching moderation, you start teaching, if you order a dessert, how about split it between the table instead of you eating the whole thing? How about I have a bite, I pass it to Tom, Tom has a bite, we pass it to Michelle, she has a bite. Everybody gets that first dopamine hit of that first taste, which we know from science, number two, the satisfaction of that food decreases and it decreases bite to bite to bite. So after about three bites, your dopamine satisfaction from that dessert is nil. Now you're just eating. Now you're just eating. Yeah. yeah. First bite, I that's get a, it. That's, that's a really good suggestion. A really nice yeah. one. 
Uh, Shanquila had a follow-up question. She said, can we mix digestive pancreatic enzymes with E3 Advanced Plus and take together uh, with a meal? And the answer is yes, absolutely. I do it often if I'm gonna have a big meal. Uh, I take extra hydrochloric acid uh, with E3 Advanced Plus. I don't with um, Wheat Rescue because we put some hydrochloric acid in Wheat Rescue. But so many, it's a 40-40 rule. By the age of 40, most of us are only making 40% of the hydrochloric acid we used to. Right. So it's a, it's a really good thing to consider to help digestion all um, down the road. Uh, Genevieve asked the question, can you send me the name of the enzyme and if it's a, easy to get in Canada? Yes, Genevieve, we'll post the links here. Uh, the, the team will post the links uh, for both of the enzymes and um, they'll give you a, a message here that everybody can read about um, how to order it in Canada outside the US. Um, and we're also gonna post links for Keith's whole um, portfolio of things that they've got for you about paleo and about how do you get started. And I think your book's there. Uh, one of the links we have is for your book. And then we have a link for some other events that you've done. Uh, I believe we do. And so we're gonna post all that so people can follow up whether they're at 101 or at PhD level. Sure. that there's there's always more to learn and you certainly can get it from uh keith and michelle norris they are the i'm sorry man i'm going to say it you're you're the godfather uh of this current movement you know although your hair is still dark i appreciate it yes it is still <laughs> 56 years old and it's still dark i get accused of coloring it all the time and i'm like i am i am way too lazy to color my hair <laughs> me too i get accused of coloring all the time <laughs> That's great. Um, uh, let's see. Susanna says, I had a gluten-free sandwich and had cramping the next day. Could it have been contaminated with a lot of gluten? How many of the E3 Advanced Plus uh, pills should be taken? Yeah, um, there could have been some kind of contamination in the sandwich. It could have been um, uh, uh, wheat, uh, gluten, or other components of wheat. We've talked about the study many times that... Uh, Columbia University in 2019 sent 804 people out into the community with testing equipment for gluten. And they went into gluten-free restaurants and they ordered off gluten-free menus. They were told to order seven things and each of them had the equipment to test seven different foods. So they ordered seven things on the menu. There were three people or some, you know, whatever. And the waiter said, you want this? And wow, oh yeah, we're hungry, right? And when the waiter waitress walks away, they open up the briefcase, took out their testing equipment, put it on the table. When the waiter waitress comes back and delivers the food, they immediately take it and test it. So 804 users, seven foods each, 5,624 foods that they tested. Was there any hidden gluten in the gluten-free foods? And this is from Columbia University um, and Peter Green, um, uh, some of the godfathers in celiac disease, gastroenterologists who've been doing this for many, many years. 32% of everything on a gluten-free menu is not gluten-free. 52% yep. of pizza, gluten-free pizza is not gluten-free. 54% of gluten-free pasta is not gluten-free. And you know that's unfortunate, but that's the facts. It is a fact. 5,624 foods, you're not safe. Uh, but wait, you said that if I even have a little gluten, it can be a problem. That's right. So well, what do we do? You take the enzymes before you start eating anything that in the remotest chance could be contaminated. You take Tom, the enzymes. I can, Tom, I can tell you and for your listener that if Michelle were here, back when she ran a catering company, she catered specifically. <laughs> she catered I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I've got this motion going here. Uh, uh, I just, yeah. oh, there we go. <laughs> this is, this is the weekly, weekly hello from my son to everybody. Hey. Out there. And uh, he is just the happiest boy. Uh, his breakfast this morning was oatmeal with homemade applesauce and it was all over his face and his arms and his <laughs> chest and it was everywhere. Oh. It was, it was. Everywhere. It was everywhere. everywhere. And lunch was, uh, of course, breast milk a couple times throughout the day, whenever he wants. <laughs> oh yeah, that makes him happy. <laughs> and lunch was um, 
asparagus and green beans and broccoli. Uh, what? Glutini? Zucchini. 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 And uh, we were at a restaurant for lunch and uh, they just bring us a plate of vegetables, uh, no salt or anything on it. And uh, so Gio just ate away and just everywhere again. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but this is, um, this is our pride and joy. This nice. Little... Yeah. yeah. Children are a joy. They, they are. are. You know, and we, we need to raise children like this who hopefully will have extremely high um, uh, clarity of thinking yes, to absolutely. change this crazy world that we created. You know, because they've got to think outside the box. It was Einstein that's quoted as saying, the problems we've created today cannot be solved with the same level of thinking that created the problem. It's very true. We can't fix these problems. Yep. And so we need the new brains, hopefully. Yes. It's going to be a lot on their shoulders in the coming decades. So, yeah. Yes, there is. So sorry for the distraction. No, no I'm not. I'm not sorry. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> no, not at all. Not yeah. at all. Uh, let's see. Um, there's another question that came in. Um, could it, let's see. Okay, could it be, Genevieve says, could it be the Xantan that makes a gel in the intestine and slows the digestion? Uh, I'm sorry, I just don't know what you mean by Xantan. X-A-N-T-A-N. -A -A Keith, do you know that term? I don't either, no. X-A-N-T-A, okay. Bonnie asked the question, is tolerase on its own enough to counter gluten? Tolerase has been shown, and it's the ingredient in Wheat Rescue that we added to the E3 formula, and we took out the uh, bacteriophages, uh, and we added the tolerase and hydrochloric acid and lipase to the Wheat Rescue, so it's more digestive function. Tolerase is great. It's been shown to be effective at digesting multiple peptides of wheat within, uh, it starts within five minutes and certainly it's complete within 60 minutes. So before food comes out of the stomach, is it enough by itself to counter gluten? The study suggests that it is uh, an effective ingredient by itself. Uh, but I put three other digestive enzymes in there, plus the E3 uh, triple uh, uh, digestive enzyme package. I put it all in there just to make sure, because we can't we can't be too um, sure that you we're can. eliminating any toxic exposures you get. And Tom, I was gonna I was gonna say before your before your boy made his his awesome appearance that back when Michelle uh, ran a catering company, she catered the one part of the catering company. She catered specifically to people who had severe gluten intolerance. So she had to certify under no uncertain terms that they had no gluten in the meals that she made. To be able to do that, she had to cook out of a kitchen that was certified gluten free, that nothing had ever been made in that kitchen that contained gluten. And to find a kitchen like that yeah. is extremely difficult. And we were in a town that's a foodie town in Austin, and it was extremely difficult to find a kitchen that was certified gluten free, because if that food does not come from a certified gluten free kitchen, even though it is gluten free, cross contamination is just apparently gluten is like pixie dust. It it's just infiltrates nanograms, nanograms is right. all it, a millionth of a gram is right. all it takes to activate the inflammatory cascade and leaky gut if you have that sensitivity. It right. doesn't take much at all. And it's the gluten intolerance group that worked for years to put the certification package together for restaurants. I mean, the book literally is this thick of everything they have to go through. Right. And California Pizza Kitchen was certified. It was one of the first major chains ever to be certified uh, gluten free that they've got they they went the extra mile they have separate tables to work on separate ovens separate handle handles uh, so uh, there are places like that out there and available uh, but not that many that but to are your certain. point I mean if 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 that sensitivity is that high I yes order gluten free for sure and 
have your backup ready because you just don't know. You just don't know. Bonnie says, oh, okay, Bonnie, that's the answer to your question on tolerance. Deb says, I have a very bad case of eczema. How can I fix this from the inside? Great question, because anything that you want fixed means it's broken, your skin or in this case, and you want to fix it. There's a big picture concept you have to understand. And then depending on the doctor you talk to, they might say this, they might say this, they might say this, but this is the umbrella, the big picture concept. All chronic diseases like eczema is a chronic condition that you get. All chronic diseases are diseases of inflammation. At the cellular level, the cell is on fire. So it doesn't matter if it's a brain cell or a skin cell. What matters is, is it gasoline or kerosene? Is it charcoal lighter fluid or turpentine? Where is the inflammation coming from? That is the million dollar question. And that's the paradigm, uh, Deb. That's the paradigm. If you hold that paradigm, and both of my books, we, we walk you through this in detail. But if you hold that paradigm, then all of the things you learn about eczema are going to make a difference. Uh, that they seem to help. Well, in this person, this is where, uh, for example, for some people, it's gluten. Just type gluten and eczema. And you'll see there are many studies that sometimes, or type dairy and eczema. Sometimes it's dairy. Or type bacterial infections and eczema. Sometimes it's bacteria. Or type uh, viruses and eczema. Sometimes it's viruses or type heavy metals and eczema. Sometimes you got heavy metal poisoning. My point is there's no um, uh, package, that the package is different for every individual. Yeah. And unfortunately, you got to do the grunt work. And you, you can like work with someone who says, yeah, we'll take care of your eczema. And if they're not looking for the sources of inflammation, they may have a pretty good fire extinguisher that puts the fire out for a while, but the, the, the fire inside is going to keep burning. If you keep eating dairy, if that's the problem, or you keep eating wheat, if that's the problem, you're going to keep having problems and you're going to be addicted to this medication or this nutraceutical to deal with the eczema. So my point is there's no question there's gasoline on your fire right now. No question. So where is it coming from? That's the journey you have to take. And that's what functional medicine is all about. Exactly. Exactly. Getting to the root cause, root cause analysis. Yeah. Always. Uh, Jill asked the question, are seeds like chia, hemp, and sunflowers considered grains? And do they have the same lectins, protective proteins that are harmful like wheat grasses? Keith, what do you think? Interesting. So whether or not they are considered grains, I'm not sure. Um, I do know many people tolerate them fine. I particularly don't have a craving for them or, or they don't come across, they don't come across the bowel that often for me, um, but I don't eschew them when they do and I feel fine and I'm pretty dialed into my body. But I, again, I don't eat them I don't eat a lot of them when I do eat them and I don't eat them very often. So it may just be that they just don't affect me. Um, and so that, that that's a personal anecdote. Right. 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 So the, there is a test and people who have been listening to me for a while know that I talk a lot about the zoomers because you zoom in on the problem. These blood tests that uh, Mayo Clinic refers to them and this is in the research papers, a new era in laboratory medicine, that these tests are so accurate. They're right on the money. And I've done this, you know, I would take um, a blood draw from someone and I would take out the tube of blood. I do two tubes from the same draw. So it's the same blood. And I changed the names on one of the tubes. So one was the patients that went in and then I did a John Doe. And I paid for it myself. And I did that with laboratories to, because I couldn't believe what a friend had told me. But it turned out the labs I were using, the results often come back completely different. 
Sure, I can believe the same that. person. Yeah, that doesn't happen with the Zoomers, and they're ninety-seven to ninety-nine percent sensitive and ninety-eight to one hundred percent specific. So I tell you that about the category of the Zoomer test. You can learn all about them at thedoctor.com, the dr.com. Uh, and I tell people, download the information, take them to your doctor, and ask them to order this test for you. And if they don't, you can order the test from us, but I'd rather you have your doctor do it so that they can learn about it, right? And there is a Zoomer called the Lectin Zoomer. And it's 97 to 99% accurate. So you do that blood draw, it'll tell you if you're sensitive to chia seeds or to hemp seeds or to hemp proteins or to sunflower. It'll tell you about seeds and nuts. So you do the lectin zoomer. There's, there's a book that came out called The Plant Paradox. Really good book, really good book. My only problem with the book is that he said nobody should eat lectins. And I just don't believe that's true because lectins don't stimulate an automatic immune response the way wheat does. Right. It's automatic for every human with wheat. That's not true with lectins. But no one should eat lectins if their immune system is fighting lectins because right. your immune system is the armed forces in your body. It's there to protect you, right? So do the test to see, do I have a problem with lectins? It's called the lectin zoomer. And then you'll know, uh, Jill, it's a really good question you asked. Then you'll know whether or not your body can handle those things. And that's a good lesson in individuality as it pertains to diet. That's exactly right. Right. Uh, Cheryl asked the question, how much does IV ozone take down inflammation? IV ozone helps with leaky gut, right? So that's the question. And Keith, do you have any experience with IV ozone? You know, I did, uh, Michelle and I were, were uh, in Mexico, I think it was like three years ago, she was having, um, she had some mercury fillings that she still had in her mouth. And we went to Mexico to have them uh, removed, which is not nearly as sketchy as what it might sound like. This place was fabulous. I mean, off the wall, fabulous. And uh, they had some side benefits, like you could go get ozone treatment, uh, blood ozone treatments. Um, and at the time I was working with a practitioner and um, he said, hey, you might wanna go ahead and do these, uh, do these blood ozone treatments on the off chance you have any you know, uh, bacteria, parasites in the blood system and that will eliminate it. He, he, he said, I'm not saying you do have that, but I mean, they're cheap and you know, it's kind of like getting your oil changed. If you don't have anything, it's no blood, no foul, pardon the pun. Um, but if you do, it will eradicate it immediately. So that's as much as I know about blood ozone treatments. Yeah, yeah, they, they, they can be very effective. How much does it take down inflammation? It depends on where the inflammation's coming from. Right. If you've got a fire and you have a little garden hose of water to put the fire out, but you have the same size garden hose of gasoline going onto the fire, do you think it's gonna work? Right. You know, so you have to identify where's the inflammation coming from. Ozone is a great treatment, very helpful. I used it with my mother when they wanted to amputate her leg. We said no, and it was just an ugly mess of ulcers from bed sores. It was, oh man, it, and it smelled bad. Uh, I didn't know this was happening. And when I found out, I was, no, you're not amputating my mother's leg. I got her in an ozone machine and it worked right away. So it was really helpful for right. that. Um, our Zoomers available in Canada. They are very happy to ship um, overseas and so over, over country boundaries. Um, I don't know that they're set up for it yet, but you can write to um, testing at the dr.com and ask my team, they'll, they'll let you know uh, if uh, we can help you with the Zoomers in Canada. Uh, Kristen says, so the wheatgrass powder I put in my smoothies can be contributing to my chronic inflammation. Oh, absolutely. Uh, here's the thing about wheatgrass. Um, uh, there's an entire institute called the Hippocrates Institute. It's been around for 40 years and they have saved tens of thousands, if not more, people from de devastating diseases. And one of the components of their treatment protocols was wheatgrass juice. 
And so it became well known about wheatgrass juice. Here's the problem. About day 17 of the wheat sprout growing, that's when the genes start to get activated to make protein. And so if you are harvesting your wheatgrass, day 18, 19, 20, you've got the toxic proteins in that juice. But if you're growing your own wheatgrass and you harvest around day 11, 12, now it's not gonna be as high, so you don't get as much juice, which is why they let it grow high, because then you get more juice and you can sell more wheatgrass, right? But now the, the um, uh, DNA has been activated to make proteins. Right. Now you got gluten in the wheatgrass juice. So if you make your own at home and you harvest before day 15 to be safe, as far as I know, you're perfectly safe. You buy commercial stuff, absolutely not. Abs no, it's not safe, absolutely not. So the answer, Kristen, is yeah, it could be causing your chronic inflammation. So your goals were right and correct. You know, well, I'm gonna take this, this is healthy, it's gonna help me be healthier. Great concept, valid concept, just poor product for, not, not even a poor product, just a product that for your sensitivity was a little too much. Much rather hear that you're doing a bowl of mixed uh, berries uh, once a day. Uh, blueberries and raspberries and black raspberries and mulberries and not so much strawberries. There's some benefits, but not as much. So don't load up on a lot of strawberries and put some uh, slice of banana in there. You know, a banana is a prebiotic. It feeds the good bacteria in your gut. Um, it's not just a sweet fruit. So you can have a little, you know, shaves of banana in this beautiful fruit bowl. That would be much safer, more comprehensive, um, and more likely uh, beneficial for you than commercial wheatgrass juice. Keith, anything you want to add to that one? You know, uh, just talking, just kind of a funny aside. I remember being a kid back in like 75, 76, and wheatgrass was all the rage in the health food stores. Yes, yes. Yeah, it had a massive and... Uh, I remember drinking it for it because, you know, I was a kid. I've, I've always been interested in health and wellness and training. And it was just my thing. And uh, I remember drinking wheatgrass for a while. And I remember the taste at that time was horrible. Oh, it's bad news. Right? It was absolutely <laughs> horrible. And thank goodness about this time, I, I saw the first Rocky. I think that came out like 76 the first Rocky. And when Rocky was chugging the uh, raw eggs, right, right. I put away the wheatgrass and shifted <laughs> to raw, raw eggs at that moment. And the raw eggs, in my opinion, went down a lot better than the wheatgrass. Yeah, oh, that, yeah, that stuff was terrible tasting. I gotta <laughs> agree with you on that. Um, uh, let's see, Nancy's here from Glenview. Hi, Nancy. I used to live behind Walker Brothers on Waukegan. Uh, Annie's here from Ontario, Canada. Alice is here from Virginia. Amal's here. Hey, Amal from Marina Del Rey. Uh, thanks so much for your kind words. Mary's here from sunny Arizona. Deb's here from Nova Scotia. Homa's here from uh, Orange County, California. Maggie's here. Oh, thank you, Maggie. It's 7.20 a.m. in the Philippines. Really? Wow, so it's earlier than in New Zealand. Boy, I, I need a geography lesson. I just don't know where, where the Philippines are compared to Australia. I'll have to look on a map. So thank you for being here. That's, it's really great that you're yeah. here. Thank you. Maggie says, baby steps. Absolutely right, Maggie. Deb says, I have a very bad, okay, we did the eczema. Uh, Bonnie says, hello, Dr. Tom. Thank you for educating us and sharing your experience. Well, thank you, Bonnie. It's really nice. Tina says, is autoimmunity drastically changed from following a paleo diet? Huh. I don't know that it's, so the underlying issues are negated because you're taking away many of the triggers. Right. I mean, uh, that's. Right. The, the answer that I would say is yes, no. <laughs> yes, it depends. No. As yeah. Keith just said, you know, yeah. if the causes of the inflammation are your food selections right and by following this umbrella guideline of eating style 
you eliminate those trigger gasoline on the fire, then yep. you're, you're going to feel like a million bucks. Yep. So yeah, it can be, it, it can be, but right. It, uh, so if you have Hashimoto's, your Hashimoto's might go into remission. And right. there are many, many people that have talked about that with the paleo approach that they've had that result. It's very common. So right. if that was the trigger, but then again, your Hashimoto's could be caused by too much plastic exposure because yep. BPA that's in plastic bottles and everything, BPA binds on your thyroid and your immune system can attack it and you start making antibodies to that damaged tissue and here comes Hashimoto's years right. later. So it just depends on what the trigger I is. Will, I will say it's the low hanging fruit, right? The easiest yeah. thing for somebody to change immediately and test drive and see how they feel is to change the diet. That's a good point. Really right. good point. That's, that's very low hanging fruit. Easy to do. Uh, Bonnie says, what is your opinion on the NMR lipo, lipo profile uh, test for cardiovascular risk? It's a really good profile, Bonnie. I don't think it has uh, uh, TMAO on it. It may, if it does not, add TMAO and you've got a comprehensive protocol. TMAO is one of the new kids on the block of high risk markers for cardiovascular disease. And it comes from having too much of the wrong bacteria in your gut. So the choline and the carnitine that you get from your food, the, if, the bad bacteria loves that stuff and it'll produce something called trimethylamine, TMA. And then that gets in your bloodstream and your liver tries to do something with it and makes it TMAO which is arguably now the highest risk factor for plugging up your pipes. Much worse than cholesterol. Good cholesterol, bad cholesterol, good HDLs, bad HDLs, much higher incidence of risk factor when you have elevated TMAO. So it's not, not an expensive test. It's easy to do, simple blood draw. You know, you, you can add it on. I, I'm going to make up the number because I don't really know what the number is, but it should be like for 80 bucks, for $80, you should be able to add TMAO to whatever blood test you're doing. And it may be a little bit more, maybe a little less, I don't know, but it is the highest risk factor right now um, uh, for cardiovascular disease. And I don't have any evidence of this, uh, but um, uh, Keith will know. Uh, there was a monster trainer in the world of training. He had a certification program and there were five levels. And to become a level five, you had to have one of your clients win a medal in the Olympics. This is oh, wow. Poliquin, Charles Poliquin. Charles Poliquin, sure, yeah. Famous name. Yep. And the guy was a monster. You know, we've lectured to, actually, when I met my wife, uh, no, no, that's not true. It, it was in Dublin. It was in the same room where I met my wife, but I lectured uh, for uh, Charles events. And uh, the guy's a monster. So for breakfast, it's like a Blues Brothers movie. We sit down in the restaurant, waitress comes over and he'll say, he'll say, two large T-bone steaks, ma'am. Rare, <laughs> as rare as you can. You want a potato with that? No, ma'am, just the two steaks. And he uh, just, he would eat monstrous amounts of meat and not much else. And his arms were as big as my thighs. Yep. Just a monster guy. But unfortunately, he passed in his early 50s of a heart attack. Yep. He, he never checked his TMAO. And I suspect, because he'd do his cholesterol once in a while and he did a ton of nutrition. Um, uh, he was very knowledgeable, really smart guy but he never checked his TMAO. So um, any patient that I see now or asks me about what, what, what blood test should I do for cardiovascular risk, uh, this was a good one that Bonnie mentioned, the NMR lipo profile test, it's a good one. It has uh, homocysteine and C-reactive protein and the good and the bad cholesterol and the different types of good and bad cholesterol. I mean, it's a good test, but if it doesn't include TMAO, you need to include that. I just wrote that down so that I can ask my doc about it the next yeah. time I do blood work. Yeah, thank yeah, you for yeah. that. And it's startling to see. but And it's caused by dysbiosis. Too much of the bad guys in the gut, not enough of the good guys. So six months rebuilding a microbiome and 
your TMAO should come down in a couple of weeks if you do it properly, but six months and you've changed the microbiome enough to where you probably can have some eggs or some fish again uh, or meats in general. Uh, but that's a danger of the umbrella of paleo that people don't know. And that's just one thing I wanted to mention is sure. if you're going to do paleo, it's great. But let's just get a blood test done just to make sure you don't have cardiovascular risk now sure. and make sure to include TMAO in that. Yeah. And that's that recommendation, that's, yeah. Yeah, um, we're, we're over the hour. I mean, again, it just, it just goes way too fast. The others- Time flies. It does, it does. So uh, our team is posting the links to all of Keith's uh, books and their handout and the, and the events that they've got so that I'd recommend that if you want to learn more from the godfather and godmother of all of this, I don't know if you, they've used that term for you before, but even with your dark hair, I'm going to refer to you as a <laughs> godfather here in Palo. You've been doing this for so long. So yeah. their, their site and their information is first class. You'll be well served to, uh, if you're looking into this world, make sure to use them as one of your resources. And Keith, thank Very you much. so much for being here with us tonight. It's really great, man. Tom, thank you. And thank you to your team. Your team held my hand throughout this whole process. And let me tell you, a shout out to your team because I was not the easiest person to wrangle the last couple of weeks. We have been on the road, traveling out West, no internet for days. It, it's been, it's been, it was beautiful. It was fun. And as far as doing business, yeah it was kind of rough so thank yeah. you to dr tom's team well thank you i'll pass that on to everyone i know i uh, every day you know we're uh, as a team we do this gratitude thing where we uh anyone any of, or all of us if we want to say something you know what i woke up so i'm just grateful for dot 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 whatever it is and we're reinforcing and supporting each other and doing that they're just a great great team laura's here tonight and i forgot to i saw her here and then there was a question right below Laura, so I didn't do the shout out. Uh, hi, Laura, thank you for being here tonight. Laura's in Oregon. She's one of our senior members, been here with me for the longest time and has held my hand all over the world. Oh, again, spectacular again, team, again. spectacular. And Tom, we work with a lot of different teams as you might expect. Oh. And your team is far and away just top notch. Just oh, well, top -notch. thank you, man. I'm going to frame that. I'm going to cut that out and let's cut that piece out and let's send it to everyone <laughs> to see. All right. Totally. Totally. <laughs> all right, everyone. Thank you so much. We'll see you next week. Bye bye. Bye guys. Good.